Welcome to week number 12. Has it really been 12 weeks we've been studying this series? I, I'm glad that you've uh, stayed with us on this journey through the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we're studying all these different people, and, and I know that when we look at these individuals that throughout the, the scripture, we, we might sometimes have the hesitation or, or the, uh, the temptation to raise them to a level that they really don't deserve. They don't deserve to be worshipped like God deserves to be worshipped because these are ordinary people who lived out an extraordinary faith. You see, they made a conscious decision, they made a choice to live in a day-by-day relationship with God Almighty that revolutionized their life and gave them the ability to have this extraordinary faith. And so I pray this prayer, God, let these people be an example to us. Let them be a, a testimony so that we might live also a life of extraordinary faith. Today we're going to talk about the guy named Gideon. All right, Gideon. All right, so and and I'm gonna I'm gonna use a storytelling uh, kind of a format again. Uh, I think it's a good way of telling the story. So I won't be reading the biblical account from the book of Judges, but I will be basically paraphrasing that, and then we'll make several points of application before we close. I, I think that stories are something that are very very helpful to us. Jesus indeed was the greatest storyteller that ever lived and walked on this earth. He was a master at telling stories so that people would remember the point of his, you know, the, the, the point of the, the, the sermon. And so storytelling, I think, can help us to remember things and, and bring them back to our memory. A story tell, uh, storytelling is something that sometimes, though, we get mixed up. We have true stories, and then we have things like Aesop fables or fairy tales. I want, you to t- I want to, you to know this morning that the story I'm telling this morning is a true story. It is a historical event story. It is in the Bible, and so we can know with certainty and guarantee that these events did happen. So Gideon, he doesn't get as much airplay as some of the people that we've been talking about the last 11 weeks, but he is mentioned and listed in Hebrews chapter 11. It says in verse 32, the writer is kind of coming to the conclusion of, man, I've been writing a whole lot of stuff and says, and, and what am I going to tell you? Uh, I, 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 there's so much more to say. He said, I, I haven't even told you about Gideon. And then he lists a whole bunch of other people that he hasn't even got to tell their stories about. So if you'll do this for me, would you turn to Judges chapters 6 and 7, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, seventh book in the Old Testament, Judges chapters 6 and 7, there are Bibles in front of you to the left or right, maybe you have your tablet and can turn to that instead, but again, I'm not going to be reading those chapters, but I'm going to be referring to almost the entire two chapters that we're going to look at here this morning. So here's a key New Testament verse, though, that is going to underline today's message and also next week's message. And that is Romans chapter 8, verse 31, when Paul says, What then shall we say uh, in response to all of these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? I want you to keep that in mind as we study the life of Gideon today. But I also want you to keep that in mind for yourself. Because there's often times where we feel alone. Often times we feel that we are uh, being picked on and this world is unfair and there's injustice that comes our way. And yet it's still true that if God is for us, then there's not anyone that can stand against us. Now, last week, we left Israel at Jericho. You may remember that Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and God took the walls, and he just kind of pushed them over inside of the town, and the people rushed in, and they defeated the, the people of Jericho. And then Joshua, who's the leader now of the Israelites, he, he's taken the baton from Moses. Now he's going to be leading the conquest of the promised land, the land that was promised way back to Abraham centuries before this time. And that's exactly what Joshua does. Through the next several years, they, con- uh, they do a conquest of the entire land. And after they're, they're done purging the land of the enemies of God, the 12 different tribes, they settle in different parts of what we would call Israel. And they all have their different areas and the descendants of their families that are raised in those areas. Uh, judges 
It's where uh, it, it helps us to understand about a guy named Gideon. And, and, and they judges, they were appointed around this time because there was some need of some local disputes, maybe some tribal disputes between two of the different tribes of Israel. But the judges also served not just only as a court system, but also as the spiritual guide and lead for the nation. So beyond, of course, the natural disputes that were coming up between the people of Israel, the, you know, the neighbors or friends or tribes, there was another much more dreadful problem. And that was this, that the people of God were not consistently faithful to him. The people of God were not consistently faithful to him. In fact, we see this clear and repeated cycle throughout the Old Testament. And, and, and I'm going to use hands on a clock to kind of illustrate this. So at 3 o'clock, the people turn away from God. And at 6 o'clock, God punishes God's, his own people with maybe an enemy nation. At 9 o'clock, the people repent of their sins. They turn back to God. They ask him for mercy. And then at 12 o'clock, God restores them and brings blessing upon them once again. The problem was the people of Israel had a learning disability, and they repeated this process over and over. It's almost like a, you know, a fan where that cycle just continued to go around and around. and around. You know what the definition of insanity is, right? You try the same thing, hoping for different results. Well, that's what the people of Israel were doing. They were not consistently faithful with God. And so when we pick up Gideon's story in Judges 6 and 7, it's gone past 3 o'clock. The people have turned away, and now it's at 6 p.m., the people have been punished by God. And specifically, he's using a, an enemy called the Midianites. And they come in and they attack Israel. And they are ruthless. They come in and they steal their crops. And any of the crops they don't steal that they can't take back with them, they burn. They destroy so that they're starving to death. They come in and do the same thing with their animals. They kill some of the animals. They take some of the animals back with them. And so for several years, the people of Israel have left the cities and they've gone into the mountainous regions and they're living in caves. Truly, they just, they're just like nomads in, this, in their own country. The Midianites, again, would steal and kill and destroy all these things. And there was no point in trying to go up against them in battle because they were far outnumbered and they would have been slaughtered. And so now the people, now the people cry out to God and ask God for his help. So let me make a parallel here. Have you ever hurt someone that's important to you or betrayed someone or ignored someone in your life? Okay, Mark's not the only one, okay? And then what happens is many times in our life, we get in a jam or a pickle or a situation where the only person that's going to be able to help us out of that jam is the person that we've ignored or betrayed or hurt in some way. And that is a very humbling experience to have to go back to that person and ask for their help after we have been unfaithful to them. But this is exactly what's going on with Israel. They have betrayed, they have ignored, they have, they have rejected God, and now they're coming back and groveling before him. Oh God, would you please be merciful? Would you please help us in some way? And even after rejecting him, God is compassionate and God is kind. And yes, God is going to restore them, but he's going to raise up a deliverer who is going to bring things right and make things right. But again, it's, it's a deliverer that, well, we probably wouldn't think about, at least in worldly standards. But you know what? God's got a way of doing that. He's pick, he picks the people that the world will look at and go, what does that guy, what does that woman have to offer? There's no way that that person can lead. And so here's Gideon. We find him, he's threshing wheat in his little, little village, his little area. And he's probably hoping to, to thresh the wheat and get it into, into storage before the Midianites come and make another raid and destroy the food that he's going to store up and maybe, maybe starve to death. That's when an angel of the Lord comes and sits down under a tree next to him. And he says, you, mighty warrior. Now, this part's not in Scripture, but I wonder if Gideon kind of looked around and thought, who, who are you talking to? Are you talking to me, you know, kind of thing? Or, or, or maybe he laughed a little bit at the notion or the concept that he would be a mighty warrior. But remember that Gideon's name does mean mighty warrior. In fact, it also means the word destroyer. And yet, uh, to this point, Gideon has not lived up to his namesake. Well, when the angel then says to him, he says, you, uh, God is going to be with you. And in fact, God is with you. Well, then Gideon kind of goes on a little diatribe. Incredulously, he asks, well, where has that God been the last several years when we've been getting our behinds kicked by the Midianites? 
Where has that God been? Where is the help that he's promised us been in these times? And then Gideon just can't help himself, and so he goes a little bit farther. He says, I've read about the God that has done great things in the past, but I don't see that God right now. Where is he? Let me make another correlation. You know what happens when you complain about something that's not getting done either in your home or at your job or at church or something like that? What happens when you complain about something that's not going to get done? You get to do it, right? Someone says, well, you've noticed that, therefore, it's like no one ever cleans the microwave. Well, then you get to clean the microwave for the rest of your earthly days, all right? It's your job forever and ever. And that's kind of what happens here. So Gideon is talking about this, and the angel said, you know what? I'm really glad you pointed this out, all right? Because you're going to be the guy. You're going to be the deliverer. You're going to be the one who's going to deliver the hands, the, the people from the hands of the Midianites. You're going to save Israel from all of the destruction of the Midianites. And just kind of like Moses, Gideon has some excuses. He's got some reasons why he can't do this. But the angel again says to him, he says, I'm going to be with you. You do not have to worry about this. He says, in fact, I'm going to turn you into someone like a Rambo or a Chuck Norris, and you're going, to, you're going to wipe out all the... And did you know, by the way, that behind Chuck Norris's beard, there's not a chin, there's another fist? Okay, there's, I got a lot of Chuck Norris jokes. But anyway, in other words, I'm going to turn you into someone who's going to be able to save your people and be the deliverer and the mighty warrior that your name calls you to be. Now, again, I can say Gideon's not quite convinced of this. And he says, hey, listen, I I, I need a sign. Can you give me God's business card? Can you help me out in some way to know that this truly is happening and I'm truly the one that you want? So the angel asks Gideon to prepare a meal for him. And he goes off and prepares the meal. And when he comes back with the food, the angel doesn't want it in his lap. He says, sit it down on this rock. The angel takes his staff and he touches the food with his staff and fire consumes that food and then the angel disappears. Now, again, that could mean either that that's the sign or that really Gideon's not a very good cook and the angel said that I don't want to eat that stuff. No, it's a sign from God, all right, that this is the right thing. You are the right God that I'm the, I have picked you and you are going to deliver these people. Next, God asks Gideon to do some black ops work, some Navy SEALs stuff. He says, I want you to go into your village and I want you to tear down the false, the altars to the false gods. I want you to burn them, I want you to get rid of them, and I want you to set up an altar to me who is the one true living God. Well, needless to say, when you destroy other people's property, they're not really happy about that. And so they want Gideon's head. They want to kill Gideon. But his father, Joash, comes out and he basically says this. If the God that you are making an altar to is a real God, why can't he fight for himself? Why can't he uh, stave off the person who's trying to destroy the altar? And he goes on and says, you know what, I think that makes a lot of sense. And in fact, not only that, but he said, if you mess with my kid, I'm going to kill you. And that kind of quelled the mob, and they, they kind of just backed off of their desire to kill, uh, kill Gideon. Well, the Midianites, they decide they're going to make another raid into Israel. All right, and they invite all their friends and family to join them on this raid. In fact, they say, listen, everybody who's anybody is going to be there. In fact, you're going to be able to come take some parting gifts home with you uh, on behalf of the Israelites. In fact, not only this, but maybe you've got all this pent-up energy that you've not been expelled. Now's the time to come and expel all that pent-up energy, uh, energy upon the Israelites. But little did they know the many nights were inviting their friends and family to their own funeral. Oh, but wait a minute, I'm getting just a little bit ahead of myself here. So God says to Gideon, he says, listen, I want you to gather an army. I want you to gather all the men from the different tribes. I want to have you gather them together because these are my people, all of my people, all of my relatives. So I want you to picture in your mind this. There's two different armies, and they're not that far away from each other. And picture the one army, it's... It's large and it's well-trained and these are true soldiers. And then picture on the other hand, the smaller army that's basically made up of farmers. And that's kind of the idea of what takes place in Judges chapter 6 and 7. And so you've got these, these guys who are not Spartan warriors, right? They're just farmers. And the odds, of course, are stacked very much against him. And God takes note of that. And so God comes to Gideon and says, listen, I notice that this is really an uneven fight. So I think that, uh, I think that you ought to get rid of some of the guys. 
And Gideon's thinking to himself, wait a minute, aren't we going to call in the cavalry? Aren't we going to go and search for more people? Why would, we, why would we want to get less people? But again, that's exactly what God asked Gideon to do. And so Gideon asked the men this question. He's, he's told by God to this. He says, listen, I, I, want you to, um, I, I want you to tell the men if they're scared, they can go home. Now, do you know who was scared? Gideon was scared. He was really concerned. He was very nervous about what was taking place. And so he decides to bolster his own confidence. And so he tests God. And one day he puts out this wool fleece upon the ground. He says, now God, tomorrow morning when the dew is on the ground, I want that wool fleece to be saturated with water, but the ground around it, everywhere around it to be perfectly dry. God does that next morning. It's exactly like Gideon asked. Well, just in case that was a flu, Gideon said, hey, can you reverse that tomorrow? Make the wool fleece dry, make the ground all around it, make it wet with dew. And again, God does that as well. And so Gideon has a little bit of confidence. Again, the next day, uh, Gideon reverse, uh, reverses this and, and God takes care of all this. But now God, again, he, he, he could have picked someone else. God could have, when Gideon was trying to test him, said, you know what, you just, you're doubting me too much, I'm going to find someone else. Or he could have scolded him, could have made fun of him. But no, God shows compassion. God shows compassion upon the fears that Gideon have. And I don't want you to, be, to ever forget that. That even if other people in your life don't affirm the fears that you have, God knows them. God cares about your fears. And God has compassion upon your fears. Well, chapter 7 begins again with the assembling of these armies. And they are in, again, somewhat fairly close proximity to one another. Israel has... Israel has 32,000 men that are going to fight. Now, that's a pretty good-sized army. But the Midianites have 300,000. So it's at 10 to 1 odds. That doesn't seem very good, and I'm sure all Israel knows about it. That's, again, not good odds. And so God says, listen, we've got to do something about it. Let's get rid of some of the guys. To which, again, Gideon kind of incredulously says, are, are you kidding? I, I get rid of them? We should be calling more guys in. And yet God says, no, I have a purpose. I have a reason for this. God's reasoning is this. If you win the battle, and even though the odds are 10 to 1, and it doesn't seem imaginable that you can possibly beat the Midianite soldiers, if somehow you do win, then you're going to take the credit rather than me. And I want to make sure that there is no doubt amongst the people of Israel that I am the one true God and that I'm the one who gives the power for victory. And so Gideon addresses the rest of the crowd. And he basically says this, listen, anybody who is a little bit scared, afraid, you can go home. All right, so I want you to picture this. I want you to picture that all the females in this room are gone. It's just us guys. And I'm getting, and I'm issuing you an idea, and there's a tough task in front of you, and it's going to be very dangerous, and I say to you, all the guys who are scared, you can go home. Who wants to be the first guy that goes home? <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. No one wants to be the cowardly lion in the Wizard of Oz and tuck tail and run. And you don't want to run home to mama because you can't... Uh, but it doesn't seem that the Israelites had any concern with courage because one guy leaves and then the floodgates open up and they all leave in droves. In fact, 22,000 men leave the 32,000 army and they're only left with 10,000. Now the odds are 30 to 1. 30 to 1 they have. Now, you would think by this time, well, okay, this is, this is okay. This is a big enough difference where God is going to be glorified and everything's going to be fine. But can you imagine Gideon's heart sinking when he sees these men just walking away one after another, hundreds at a time, and even thousands at a time? Yes, 10,000 were still there unafraid, but I wonder if they were a little bit nervous after two-thirds of their army had finally left. Well, even though Gideon was kind of, I think, still nervous, he was ready to lead his army into battle against the Midianites. But that's when God comes upon the scene and says, listen, you know what? I really still think you got too many guys. Now, again, this is not in Scripture, what I'm going to say next, but can you imagine Gideon just go, oh, come on. I mean, are you kidding me? What, what are you trying to do to me? You know, he's probably incredulous, at least to some degree. Maybe he didn't speak the words out loud, but I'm sure he was thinking about that inside. 
And so the winnowing process is this. They go to a nearby stream, and all the men who put their faces in the water and lap the water like dogs are sent home, and only the men who kneel down and cup the water with their hands to drink are kept. Now, again, scholars have said that's probably because the men who cupped the water were better soldiers. They were on the lookout. They couldn't see if their faces were in the water, but they could if they were drinking the water from their hands. I don't know, maybe the other guys were just thirstier, but regardless, Gideon is left with 300 men. He starts with 32,000, then he's got 10,000, and now he's got 300. The odds are now 1,000 to 1 against the people of Israel. Now think about this. These are not Spartan warriors. These are not well-trained soldiers. These are farmers. And now again, the odds are so much that God says, okay, now we're ready. Now we're ready. Now I want you to think about this. If God is really trimming the fat from the army, why wouldn't he take them all and just send them all home and let Gideon do the job himself? I mean, if he only needs 300, then he could do it with one guy as well. So why not just send them all home? And yet I believe that if it was only Gideon, they might have started to worship Gideon even over God. And so these also, these 300 men that are going to be remain behind, they're going to be witnesses of God's might and God's power, and they're going to see the glory of God in this great victory. Well, the next night, God comes to Gideon and he says, okay, it's time. We're going to go to battle. We're going to war. But again, here we see the compassion and the grace and the love of God. Because he knows that Gideon's knees are shaking. He knows he's nervous. And so to bolster his confidence, he said, hey, listen, let's do one more thing first. He said, I want you to take a couple of your servants and I want you to sneak into the Midianite camp and I want you just to listen. I want you to listen to the conversations that are taking place amongst the men there. And so Gideon does that. He goes over and he hears these two men and their conversation sounds something like this. One of the men said, I had this really weird dream last night. I was, I was in this camp in this valley and this gigantic wonder bread loaf started rolling into the valley and just crushed us all. It destroyed all of our army. What in the world does that mean? Did I eat too much bread? And the other soldier said, you know what that is? That is God, Jehovah, Yahweh, and he's using Gideon to be the one who's going to destroy us. Now, can you imagine if Gideon is listening to this, what he's thinking? Now, I, I, do not, I do not advocate listening or eavesdropping on other people's conversation, but this was a spiritual point that God knew that he needed to be encouraged. He needed to have his courage lifted up. And so he says, listen, I want you to hear this. And what's really strange is after Gideon hears this, you would think that he would run out of that camp. He'd run right back to his soldiers and he's, all right, let's go. Come on. You know what God just told me through the through two soldiers of the Midianites? They're scared of you guys. We don't have to be scared of them. But Gideon doesn't run back to his soldiers. Gideon goes to worship God. Gideon takes a time, he hits that pause button, and he just worships God. You see, God is supreme, and God is sovereign all over all. And God deserves our worship. God deserves to be honored. And so this is the time for Gideon to worship the Lord. And then he goes back to the soldiers. He wakes them up, and he says, okay, tonight's the night we're going to go into battle and I've got your weapons for you. And he gives each of the 300 soldiers a trumpet, very, very helpful on a battlefield, a torch, okay, I could get that, and a ceramic jar. I don't know, you know, and then you can cut the guys with the jar. I don't know, but anyway, can you imagine the faces of the soldiers as Gideon gives them these three things? And then he says, listen, I want you to do what I do. I want you to blow on the trumpet, and I want you to say, for the Lord and for Gideon, and then I want you to smash those jars. In other words, just follow my example, do exactly what I do. <laughs> and so when they got to the hills, they divided into groups of 100, three different groups of 100 surrounded the Midianite camp, and they, and they, and they blew their trumpets, and they smashed their jars, and they shouted, for the Lord and for Gideon. And here's the cool thing. The fear that had resided in the hearts of those 300 men was transferred to the hearts of the Midianite army and multiplied over a million times. And in sheer terror and in confusion, the Midianites began to kill one another. And the few soldiers that did get away were killed by the 300 Israelite soldiers that had surrounded their camp. And God got a great victory. Not only that, 
But we know that the two leaders of the Midianite army, they were captured, they were beheaded, and their heads were brought to Gideon. And so just like David, when he defeated Goliath and cut off his head, you've got to understand that when you follow the Lord, he really knows how to help you to get ahead. <laughs> or two. Ah, oh, it's terrible, isn't it? Just, that's, that's awful. It's just awful. So let's forget those silly, silly jokes, and let's get to the points of application. Here's the first one. Position never defines power. Position never defines power. See, Israel, Israel had 12 tribes. And you remember they were based upon the names of, of Jacob's sons and two of Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And, and each of the tribes, they had their skill set, and they were some were bigger than others. But there also were some tribes that were, they were more important than other tribes. And for instance, Judah was considered the most important tribe because, number one, King David would come from that. He would be the great-grandson of Judah. But much more important than that was that Jesus himself, the Messiah, would come. His lineage would be traced back to the tribe of Judah. Most, again, of the important people we can trace come back from Judah. So was Gideon part of the tribe of Judah? Yeah, not so much, no. Gideon was part of the tribe of Manasseh. That was one of Joseph's two sons. And Manasseh was considered the least important of the 12 tribes of Israel. Not only that, but Gideon's father and his family were considered the least important family of the tribe of Manasseh. And not only that, but Gideon was considered the least important of his generation of the family of the least important and the least important tribe of the people of Israel. You can see that he didn't have a great resume that he would not have been the person that most people would have chosen to lead this great army. But God has a way of picking people that we would not pick or that the world would not see as the ones that they would choose to lead a great army. God, again, didn't see what the man sees. God is able to see into our heart and our mind and see that which the rest of the world cannot see. So position, it doesn't dictate power. Here's the second point, and that is don't think, oh, I have nothing to offer. Don't think I have nothing to offer. God, again, created you, and he created you with a set of skills and values, and he's given you time and resources that he can use through you to do great things for his kingdom and for his sake. And so I pray that you will use what God has given to you, and it may be great, and it may be small, but whatever you have, use for his kingdom's sake and use for his glory. I have a very dear friend, he's my age, and he didn't come to know the Lord until way later in his life. And so you might say, man, all those years that he could have done great things, but he is now using the time that he has to bless people and to teach people and to help them to understand who Jesus is. So the question is, what do you have to offer? Great or small, what do you have to offer God to let him use that for his kingdom's sake? And, and also, don't listen to the naysayers. You're always going to have the negative Nancys that live in your life. Ah, oh, you can't do that. They'll mock you. They'll put you down. They will belittle you in some way. And that's okay if those people want to be jerks. But I want you to understand that you need to keep at the work of the Lord no matter what the people around you are saying. And so maybe you've been talking to your neighbor about Jesus for lots of years and it's not had any effect. They've not come to the Lord. Keep telling them about Jesus. Don't give up. Maybe you have a wayward child and you've prayed for them for decades, and they've not turned back to the Lord. Keep praying for that wayward child. Maybe you've been working on trying to eliminate the financial debt that has burdened you down. Keep working hard. Earn what you can to pay off the debt, to free you from the shackles of all that financial burden. Maybe it's at work. Maybe you feel outnumbered by everyone around you. Stay the course. Maybe you think that everyone around you is telling lies Keep telling the truth no matter what. See, keep speaking truth. Keep doing what is right. Keep your eyes upon Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of your faith, even if the world says, what are you doing? Here's a third point of application, and that is it's okay to test the waters. It's okay to test the waters. See, Gideon needed some reassurance. He needed a confidence boost to be able to knew, know that he was going to be able to, to accomplish this large task. And so he asked God, hey, would you show me a couple signs just to give me the confidence that I need? I don't think that that's a bad thing that we can do. 
I think if we are considering a large task, then maybe we need to throw out that fleece. Maybe we need to ask God, hey, give me something. Give me some confidence. Help me to understand. And so what do we do? We go to God's word because God's word is the truth. And it gives us his ideas and his will and his plan. And so we can take our plan and line it up with the Bible and say, do they match? If not, maybe we need to make another plan. And we spend time in prayer and we ask God for wisdom and discernment and knowing what he wants us to do. We also, I think, we ask a good trusted Christian friend. Hey, listen, I've got this thought. What do you think of this? And they're they're trusted enough to give you the honest response, even if you don't like it, even if it hurts you to some degree. And we should also, of course, ask God. Ask God to open and close those doors of opportunity so that we can walk where he wants us to walk. And so once in a while, if you put out your fleece, that's okay. Ask God to help confirm the things that you're thinking about doing or planning to do. And then once God has confirmed those, then get working, get busy, and get, get busy on that. Here's the, uh, here's the third thing. And that is that we need to hang with the best and not with the crowd. Hang with the best, not with the crowd. Now, Gideon could have gone to war with 32,000 men, and Gideon could have gone to war with 10,000 men, but Gideon went to battle with only 300 men. He went with the cream of the crop. He went with the very best of those that God had brought into him. See, it does not matter if we are uh, students, if we're teenagers, if we're young adults, if we're middle-aged, if we're old people. I think we all have this tendency to run in the herd We like the herd mentality. We think that there's somehow strength in numbers. Even if that herd is wrong and running towards the cliff, we're going to follow right behind them because we feel better than being by ourselves. So I want you to remember this equation. This is really astute, so you may want to write this down. Sheep follow the crowd. Sheep are stupid. Don't be a stupid sheep. All right? Sheep follow the crowd. Sheep are stupid. Don't be a stupid sheep. Find people in your life that are people of excellence, people that are trustworthy, people of noble character, and you spend your time with them. And I know that means you may need to lose a friend or two, but if those two friends, those people in your life are dragging you down and devaluing you and leading you to a where that does not honor God, then you don't need those friends in your life. Find people that will elevate you and lead you to be more like Jesus Christ. Here's a fourth thing, and that is that the enemy is often intimidating. The enemy is often intimidating. Do not underestimate Satan. He is shrewd, he's cunning, and he's coming after you. In fact, here's what John chapter 10, verse 10 says. It says, the thief, which is Satan, he comes to do three things, to steal and to kill and destroy. That's not very nice, is it? That doesn't sound very good, and yet he's coming to do that for us. And on our own, we are no match for Satan but we're not alone, are we? First John chapter 4, verse 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And that leads to our fifth point. And that is that, again, when we are for God, then God is for us. When we are for God, then God is for us. You see, Gideon reflected, it reflects, I think, the, the, the words of Paul that we read earlier from Romans chapter 8, verse 31. It says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? When God is on your side, then you are not ever alone. And I know sometimes as a Christian, you may go to work and everyone else is not a believer. And so you feel pretty much alone. You feel isolated, but you're not alone. And maybe even in your family, maybe you're the only believer in your own family. And it can feel very lonely, but you're not alone. If everyone in your social circle is not a believer in Jesus Christ and you are, it can feel kind of alone, but you're not alone. God is on your side. God is on your side. Say this with me. God is on my side. God is on my side. Say it like you really believe it. God is on my side. We have to believe that. We have to trust that. We have to know that. Do you know that that's what got Gideon through this great, great uh, triumph, this great, great battle, was he understood that God was on your side. So stand your ground. Even when you're outnumbered by the enemy and by those who would oppose you, stand your ground because God is on your side. And here's the sixth and final thing. We need to be an example to the people who are around us. Gideon tells his men, his 300 men, he says, I want you to follow my example. I want you to, I want you to do exactly what I do. 
And that sounds, uh, again, like Paul when he says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, follow my example, here's the operative word, as I follow the example of Christ. So the question is, can you say that? Can you tell people around you, I want you to be my shadow for the next week? I want you to follow in my footsteps. I want you to follow and observe my life, and I'd like you to make sure that you do what I do and say what I say and think what I think, and have the same attitude that I have. And I can say I want you to do all those things because my thought process, and my attitude, and my actions, and my lifestyle itself exemplifies that of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And I would say this to myself first, and then to you. If you're not very comfortable in asking people to follow you around and exemplify your life, what do you need to change? What needs to change so that you can truly say that with honesty? Or remember, we want to live in extraordinary faith because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for the life of Gideon. Thank you again for his unbelievable story of courage. Thank you for the fact that that he did amazing things and he did them with a jar and a trumpet and a torch. God, thank you again for reminding us that you are with us and that you are on our side. And no matter what the enemy might say, we're not alone. God, remind us that when we feel that we're outnumbered, when we feel like giving up, when we feel that it's not worth it to go on a step farther, help us to remember that you're right there with us. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.